national, it's found in every country. So it's a perfect vehicle to enable an international conspiracy to take effect. The story of Hiram Abiff suggests that the Masons go far back in history to the designers of the Temple of Jerusalem. Some push it back even further to the very founders of civilization. But how do these claims link the Freemasons of ancient times to the corridors of power today? Freemasonry has attracted the rich and the powerful and the influential. Uh, and uh, certainly as it evolved out of its medieval guild roots, it evolved into an organization which did attract opinion formers. Uh, and it's undoubtedly historically a recruitment tool that uh, you would be joining this group with esoteric secrets going back to Solomon. Solomon's temple is the key. Centuries ago, the ruins of the ancient structure served as headquarters for a band of noblemen who relinquished all their possessions to become armed escorts for visitors to the Holy Land during the Crusades. The Temple Knights, the Knights Templar. It was called a new knighthood, meaning these would be warrior monks, not merely monks who prayed all day, but not also only those who fought on the battlefield. So they began as a type of spiritual special forces for Christ, you might say. The Templars were secretive, and they became rich and powerful. But how? Solomon's temple had been the holiest of shrines. It was a storage place for the Ten Commandments. But legend says that in the depths of the stone monument was another treasure of immeasurable value. What is the treasure? Well, some authors claim it's the Holy Grail, some say it's the Ark of the Covenant, some say it's the embalmed head of Jesus Christ, some say it's the lost writings of, of Jesus Christ, and of course the other one that is the hottest is that it's in fact none of these physical things, but it in fact is the secret of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. But another theory says what the Templars discovered were two sculpted columns copied in Masonic temples today. The Pillars of Knowledge. What was this secret knowledge that so empowered the Templars? There's no end to the speculation. And the Knights Templars uh, were gaining this information under the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, which had been collected and gathered there from the ancient mystery schools of Egypt and Greece. And these were the ancient secrets that had been passed down since the beginning of time. The Templars' mix of secrecy and wealth fueled rumors of heresy, stomping on the cross, homosexual rites, even worshipping the head of John the Baptist or the image of Baphomet, the pagan idol. The Templars were accused of blasphemy by royals like King Philip of France, who grew jealous of the knight's wealth and influence. The King of France decided that he was going to acquire their wealth and so on the 13th of October, 1307, the, uh, the French authorities arrested all the Knights Templar that they could find in France. Historians say the Templars were destroyed. But according to some, the Knights did not disappear. Rather, they went into hiding in the ornate shrines they built across Europe and wielded their power in secret. In one account, the Templars are said to have joined forces with knights from Malta, warriors who turned to piracy under a symbol we all know today, the skull and crossbones. It's a depiction of the Templars' burial custom of severing a dead man's legs and arranging them as a cross. This emblem provides an iconic link between the medieval Templars and today's power elite. 
Most infamous among them is Yale University's Skull and Bones Club. Since 1832, this ultra-private fraternity for the sons of America's most powerful families has included Presidents Taft, Roosevelt, the senior George Bush, George W. Bush, and Senator John Kerry. Like the Templars, the Skull and Bonesmen keep their rituals and their agenda secret, but they proudly fly the pirate banner, a symbolic connection with the Templars, and so it's claimed, with the mystical origins of Freemasonry. Freemasonry is the latest incarnation of what is known as the underground stream. This is a hidden stream of knowledge that has been passed down since uh, the dawn of human history. Conspiracy theorists say there's an unbroken chain stemming from the builders of the pyramids to Hiram Abiff to the Templar Knights to the Masons of the 18th century and today. If it's true, this knowledge must be more than trade secrets of stonemasons. It was found, after all, in Solomon's temple, God's own house. Does this mean the Freemasons are a religion unto themselves? Their religious trappings have inspired opponents, from those who accuse them of heresy to those who claim they are in league with Satan himself. It may sound like a church, but this in fact is a meeting of a Masonic Lodge. Like a church, all nationalities are welcome, and in recent years, women as well. But it raises a question often asked by outsiders. Are the Freemasons in reality a religion? The prime qualification for entry into Freemasonry and uh, um, our Grand Lodge and, and, and the ones we're in amity with around the world is a belief in God, a belief in a supreme being. We don't define who that should be, what your religion should be, but we believe that Freemasons should have a religion and practice it. But Masonic Lodges adopt some of the trappings of a traditional church. We're entering the space that is most important in Freemasonry. Central to the furniture of a lodge is the altar. On it, you will find in an operating lodge the volume of the sacred law. What does that mean? It is basically a reference to whatever holy books that the members of the lodge believe in. I am Akram Elias, a Freemason, the senior grand warden of the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of Washington, D.C. All religions are welcome, yet the teachings of masonry itself have a religious ring. One that we hear quite often is that uh, we attempt to make um, good men better. We can't make bad men good. The other one, the one that I prefer, is a peculiar system of morality. And peculiar, of course, here means unusual or special. So in a peculiar system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols, of which we have lots and lots and lots. Of so you have a situation where a symbol, um, let's take, for example, the letter G. Um, some people believe that that stands for God in, within Freemasonry. Some believe it stands for goodness, the goodness of the human spirit. Others believe it stands for geometry. Um, and so in that way, uh, it can mean many things to many people within the organization. 
I've got on my lapel pen a square encompasses, and the center of it is the letter G. And it reminds me to square my actions by the square of virtue, to circumscribe my passions and desires, and to remember that God is in the center of my life. A moral system based on a belief in God. It certainly sounds like a church, yet the Masons insist they are not. Freemasonry is not a religion, although it incorporates into its rituals um, many symbols and ideas and motifs that appear to have some kind of religion or, or religious or philosophical overtone. We're not a religion. We're not a substitute for religion. We support religion. We expect people to have a religion. You can't come in if you're, if you're an atheist or an agnostic. You must have a belief. Um, but it is not our job to tell people what their religion should be. It's important to recognize this religious dimension and not to deny it. And it is a problem for deeply committed Orthodox Christians. Even more disturbing is Masonic lore that traces its history back to pagan civilizations. And Freemasonry seems to have inherited the practices of ancient mystery religions, which kept their rituals under wraps. The ancient mystery religions didn't let anyone in that desired. You underwent a strict test. In Freemasonry, you do as well. True Mason understands the deep meanings of the legend of Hiram Abiff, of the common gavel, of the apron, of coming to newness of life, being as you say, as we say, born again, yet Jesus is missing. And for many outsiders, this is a problem. Masonry is certainly a religion, and um, it has every, every aspect. It's, it's certainly much more ornate than the most Protestant churches. It's a religion of um, secularism, essentially. As a Christian, I do believe in the one universal uh, creative force. The Masons call it the great architect of the universe. It's the universal mass mind, uh, which pretty well qualifies as God. But is this supreme architect the God of the Bible or someone else? I maintain that you cannot be an informed Mason and a Christian at the same time without being in some kind of rebellion against God. It's a, it's a conflict between Jesus, Christ, and, and Satan. This fanciful claim is supposedly proven by Masonic references to pagan Egypt. Connections to the alleged heresies of the Templar Knights and their use of strange symbols, including the star or pentagram to some, a satanic icon. The Catholics and now the Protestants, the fundamentalist evangelical Protestant groups, uh, people like Pat Robertson, are fitting the Freemasons, or at least the leadership of the Freemasons, into a conspiracy to impose a new world order. Is all the talk of harmless rituals and wholesome values just a smokescreen for something darker? Some point to moments in history where the Masons have been accused of monstrous acts. And one of them involves the most notorious mass murderer of them all. Is history made in secret? The pyramids. Solomon's Temple, the Templar Knights. Is there a link between these and other historical landmarks forged by the Freemasons? Are they more than builders? Are they the architects of an ancient conspiracy to control the world? At first glance, they appear innocuous, a social club that encourages brotherhood, community, and personal improvement. But is this a facade for something more sinister? Time and again, shocking murders have been blamed on the Masons, 
and some say they are warnings to those who challenge the power. Or betray their secrets. <laughs> 